But let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And as we're turning there, we're looking at the disciplines that Paul lays down for Timothy. And this morning, we've come to one of the amazing of the disciplines. I mean, I think they're all wonderful, but this one is probably the one that amazes me most at how much people don't understand. The discipline of integrity that we must be pursuing. We must be making conscious individual choices to pursue godliness. Uh, the, the, I, was, I was thinking after first service of, you know, because I think in pictures, and I was thinking of how can I portray grace as God offers to it? And I started thinking of all my vast sports knowledge. Uh, I remember when I was inner tubing uh, once. I don't know if that's a sport or not. But when you slid all the way to the bottom of the hill, they had this tow rope deal. And it was just operating like mad. And you would come down to the bottom, and if you sat on your little inner tube and did what you're supposed to do, it would pull you to the top. But you could sit there all day long, and if you didn't reach out and grab onto that rope, and it would jerk you because it was going pretty fast, and if you didn't do that, you'd never get pulled up. You know, it's very much like the grace of God that brought us salvation is there's a tow rope sitting next to us every day, and this discipline is the integrity to do what we're called to do and to grab onto and to engage with that grace to pull us. You know, another way I remember, uh, uh, if you've ever been like out uh, water skiing, you know, you sit there, and if you let go of that little handle that you're supposed to hold on to, I mean, you just keep sitting there. But if you hold on tight and do everything you're supposed to, lean back and, you know, don't do all the things, you will begin going. But as soon as you take your eyes off the goal, let go, or start doing funny things, you know, like jumping the waves, you will go tumbling until you get re-engaged. Did you know that, that the, the disciplines Paul's talking about here is that God is like that, that powerful pulling rope. He wants to get us upward in our spiritual lives to grow in godliness, but we have to know and do what he asks us to do and hold on by faith. So what Paul is doing here is he's saying God wants to know how serious we are about following him. And in 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 7, God's word explains to us we have an appointment, a workout. Paul uses in this text the gymnasium. And what he's comparing the Christian life to is learning the, the sports of the ancient world. And Paul actually lists three of them that he specifically talks about. Most of all, it's foot races. But also he talks about wrestling and boxing. But, but primarily Paul's athletic metaphor, in fact, to the end of his life, you all know how Paul in 2 Timothy 4 ends his writings. He says, I fought a good fight. Now, we think that's not boxing. That's agon, the good agony, which means he's done a long distance endurance race. I have finished my course, Stadion, which was the racetrack. And I am looking forward, henceforth is later for me, a crown. And he exactly, to the end of his life, showed his Christian life was like being on a race course, running the laps until the final lap, and the whole way he was looking at the end of the, the line in the Greek games was the laurel, kind of a, a little twisted branch of leaves that was tied together, and the victor would have that placed on their head by the judge, but the judges would put that up on a pillar at the finish line. And it's kind of like every time they were running, it was seven laps around the stadium. And every lap, they were looking at that, and they were looking where they were, and they were making sure they were staying in their lane. But when that final lap came, they were straining toward the prize. Now you catch that's Philippians 3. I am reaching forth toward the prize and the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So all of Paul's life, he saw himself as an athlete, and he saw the Christian life as being disciplined in a sport, following the rules, working out, training, learning endurance, and disciplining uh, very heavily his body to do what it's supposed to do to get him to that mark. And so Paul says, we're each invited by the Lord to spend time every day working out. And this workout is illustrated by Paul with scenes from the culture of his day. In fact, you can't read the epistles of Paul without looking at, at front page events from his culture. And Paul is illustrating for these people, he's saying, 
what you look at every day as you see those, those toned and, and totally disciplined bodies of the athletes, that's what you should be in God's sight spiritually. And, and he is using those metaphors and those illustrations. Well, the bottom line is, Paul says, healthy believers are like spiritual athletes. Just like an athlete will focus, as we've just seen with the, the Winter Olympics, they will focus years of preparation to completely hone their bodies and minds into a short, impactful preparation. Did you know, if you don't maintain that rigorous schedule, you get totally out of shape? You get totally unable to do if you don't keep up that rigor. But yet they will do what it takes for years for that short burst of competition that is temporal. Paul says, look at their focus, look at their intensity, look at their discipline, and apply that to what's going to last forever. They apply it to what is short compared to eternity. You apply it to your whole existence eternally worshiping God. So basically, in the Greek world, there were many games. There were the great Isthmian games at Corinth. Paul would have seen those. He was there a year and a half. There were the great Pan-Ionian games in Ephesus. Paul was there three years. He would have seen those. And from those huge crowds, where most likely Paul was sharing the gospel and you know evangelizing, but he was also tracking and watching and would have seen the athletes, he draws the language of the athletics and he draws the spiritual application that every one of his readers would have immediately picked up on. And he says that those disciplines that those athletes have is a way to tie together the elements of sanctification that he's written about in all of his letters. And so, with that in mind, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10. And what we're going to hear from Paul is a call to the discipline of integrity. And what he's saying is, are you personally pursuing spiritual disciplines that lead you toward godliness? Are, are you personally pursuing, are you doing what we're called to do? Or do you just know you're called to do it and you're sitting on your inner tube and the rope's going by every day and you are not grabbing onto it by faith and allowing God to pull you into greater and greater godliness and God-likeness in your life. That's what he's saying. Starting in verse 7, let's stand together for the reading of God's word, remain standing for prayer, and let's listen to the Lord through the Apostle Paul as he says this in verse 7. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness, for bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And Paul says, I want you to deny those, verse 7, the bad things to your diet that are going to wreck your health. And I want you to commit to exercising yourself toward what will lead to godliness. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that this morning as we examine the truth of your word, as we see these pictures that were so vivid in Paul's mind and, and the, the longing of his heart to communicate your truth in a way that people would grab onto and then as we approach communion at the end of this service, I pray that it would be a time where believers in this body that are hearing your word would be drawn and convicted and moved by your spirit that it's time to get engaged in pursuing you and disciplining schedule and life and appetites and habits and, and planning to make sure that you are the goal, that pleasing you is the, the essence of how we schedule our days and our weeks and our budgets and our plans, and that they will be engaged in holding the rope of grace and being pulled into greater and greater Christ-likeness. And I pray that we would get the heartbeat of Paul and through your spirit change into your image this day. 
In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're seated, I, I want you to look with me at these, what Paul has already given. I call them eternally beneficial training tips. And this is a whole series of what would be called exercises or disciplines, but this is the heart of them as Paul talks about this in verse 7. But what we've already seen are these, these other disciplines. The first one we started out with many weeks ago is the discipline of truth. And basically it's the idea that this is the truth of God, that this is the, the healthy teaching of God, and we hold up the doctrine of the Word of God so that we can identify false doctrines by holding up the truth and comparing and seeing where they're deficient or inaccurate, and false teachers. It's not just the doctrines, it's the teachers who don't match up even with the character that a teacher must have to be listened to. And so Paul says, you need to know the discipline of truth, you need to discipline yourself in truth so that you can expose false doctrine and teachers. And secondly, we saw, if you look down at verse six of chapter four, the, the second discipline is the discipline of devotion. It's the idea of being connected to God. It's the idea that we need to connect to him until our own soul is nourished spiritually. It's not whether you have the food. It's not whether you have the cooking pans. It's not whether you have all the recipes. It's whether the food is consumed. And, and many people go through their life and they're assembling this vast amount. I mean, they just buy every book and every tape and every CD and they get every resource. The problem is it never nourishes their soul because they don't have time to allow it to be digested and to, to actually, just like food after 24 hours comes to the very cellular level, so truth, when it's nourished, actually comes into our very souls. It transforms us from the inside out. And that's the discipline of devotion because we love the Lord so much we want to be nourished by him. And then last week we saw the discipline of time. We reject, because God is so important, it's almost like if you have limited time, in fact, I'm so old, I remember when uh, you, you had phones that had cords on them connected to a box connected to the wall and you couldn't go anywhere. You just had to stand however the length of the cord was. But when you talk to someone special, like I remember when I used to talk to Bonnie uh, in New York and I was here in Michigan, my, you know, my parents says, okay, you, know, you have exactly however many minutes we could afford because it was so much per minute. Oh, we got down to business, and I'd say, how are you doing? What's this? And have you made this plan? How are you doing there? How do you feel? Where are you going? Can I see you? And I'm going to come visit. I'm, there, was no, there was no frivolity there. We were very focused. And what Paul is saying, once you get realizing how important your time is on earth, you reject anything that's profane, that displeases God, and anything that's empty and worthless. When you realize how, how quickly life is, is going by, you say, Lord, I only have this one life to give to you. I want to give as much of it as possible to you. So I am not going to allow my life to be consumed with what's empty and what is profane and doesn't please you. And that was last week. But this week, it's the discipline of integrity. Integrity is saying that I want to live out the personal pursuit of godliness. I don't just want to talk about it. Integrity means what I talk about, I'm doing. I, I'm not trying to live up to what I have, have uh, taught. I want to teach what I'm living. I want to, to, to have integrity in my life that if I say I belong to the Lord, I do. If I say that you bought me with a price, I want to glorify you, I am. And that's what that personal engagement, holding on to the, the powerful grace of God that wants to transform us. And so what Paul does is he begins to give the elements of what it means to live in the arena, that's the sports arena, that's focused on eternity. And what he said is, I'm living my whole life in the arena with everyone watching me, and I am living it running toward the finish line of pleasing Jesus Christ. And so he goes through a, a succession of, of explanations. Paul always shined the light of eternity across the temporary diversions of human life. Paul was so aware that life was brief and eternity was not. And Paul said, my priorities are tied to where I'm going. And he says, every day when I orient my day, he says, I look toward the upward call, that's Philippians 3.14, of God in Christ Jesus. I realized when I was saved, I was called with the holy calling. That's where I'm going. And I want everything in my life to line up and to be fitting on the pathway that leads toward pleasing God. 
Do you see how focused he was? I mean, even when he was looking at the races, he was saying, boy, the way that they prepare is how I want to prepare for heaven. The way they're straining toward the finish line is how I want to strain toward the finish line of heaven. And basically, the Apostle Paul is using all of the elements of the gymnasium to, to say that that's how we should live. Let, let me show you an example. Paul used the elements of the sport of boxing. You say, really? Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 9. He uses the word hoop opiazo. And, and that was a word, in fact, I grew up in a boxing family. Both of my father and my older brother won different fights in the Golden Gloves tournament. And I mean, they were big boxers. Not, from my earliest days, my dad was always saying, you got to, you know, keep this one back and keep this one up, always protecting, and you're always dancing around. And I said, that's, you know, I'd rather read a book, you know. <laughs> and so, but, but he would constantly do that. He'd do all of his things and, and, and make me, you know, punch at him and everything. And I didn't ever like it. But I remember once when I was on the playground, someone did something. And I didn't even think. I went like this, and I went, wham. Oh, I, and they're, I mean, blood, and they fell over. I said, I never want to do that again. And then the principal said, and you won't ever do that again, you know. <laughs> and that was the end of my boxing career. But what Paul said is, we're supposed to be hoop apiazoing ourselves. See, that's what my dad taught me, that there was a little spot, and I missed it. I got the nose. I, you know, I was trying to knock him out, and I actually, you know, bloodied their nose. But he said, if you hit that spot, you'll knock him right out. Paul said, spiritually, we're supposed to be boxing ourselves so that our flesh does not impede us from, from following Christ. You see, we have an enemy within. It's our flesh, and our flesh lives for this world. It doesn't live for heaven. And if we are not denying ungodliness and, and giving ourselves, buffeting our body, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. A lot of people buffet their body. Paul said, buffet it, you know, and be beating it down. And if we don't do that, then our flesh trips us up. Secondly, Paul used the elements of the sport of wrestling. That's Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And, and what he's saying is, in, in wrestling, you're always being cautious because you make a wrong move and they start you know, pulling your arm in and twisting you around and getting you so you're headed toward being pinned. You don't want that. And you've got to be constantly on guard. And that's what that whole spiritual armor is, that we never allow any chinks in our defense because we're in this constant hand-to-hand, face-to-face, agonizing wrestling match with the forces of darkness. And finally, Paul's favorite is that last one. Paul used elements from the sport of foot races to describe how we live every day of the Christian life. Staying in our lane, uh, focusing on the goal, uh, running for the prize, keeping our eye on that prize and the judge who awards that prize. All of those are, are metaphors. So basically what Paul is doing, and if you look where we've been so far, he said the discipline of truth is we find God's word as our source. That leads us to the discipline of devotion. We love God with all of our heart, and we want to be devoted to him and connected to him, and that leads us to the discipline of time. We, we don't want anything that doesn't please him. We reject profane and empty things because the higher goal, that pleasing God is our goal, and that leads us to this morning, the discipline of integrity that we're going to pursue personal godliness the way God says that it's attained. And that's through the means of grace that he has ordained. And basically what we're talking about is what we would call the discipline of integrity is really personal sanctification. See, personal sanctification is when I choose to hook on to the tow line. God's grace is going to tow me against the current of this world and against the gravity and uphill and toward growing in Christ's likeness. But if I neglect that discipline of, of engaging with that toe line of his grace, I'll be sliding down the hill. I will never make to where he wants me to be to accomplish his plan. And so personal sanctification is, is vital to understand. If you don't understand the concept of what God's goal is, then we won't really live in that arena. We were saved only by the accomplishment of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That's what justification is all about. That it's only what he did that opens the door for his continued work in our life as we by faith embrace it. So let's just do a quick survey of, of the differences between, because a lot of people get mixed up 
uh, with justification and sanctification. Justification is totally what God does. Sanctification is totally what God wants me to cooperate with him doing. I have to connect. I have to get involved. So justification is what Christ did for me on the cross. But sanctification is what Christ is doing in me because of the cross. So Christ wants to do something in me. But secondly, justification is immediate. It was completely finished the instant I was saved. But sanctification is an ongoing process. It's never completed on earth until I meet Jesus face to face at death or his coming. So that's why we call it progressive sanctification, which leads to ultimate sanctification when we are perfected in his image. But the process here on earth is a, is a progression, Paul says, from glory to glory, that we're changed into his image. Thirdly, justification is activated the moment I trust in the personal, in Christ Jesus and his finished sacrifice on the cross, but sanctification grows, listen to this, with each obedient choice I make, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Every time I click on to his grace that wants to pull me forward, every time I discipline myself, every time I exercise and allow him to train me, I, I am agreeing with what he wants to do. That obedient choice, empowered by the Holy Spirit, grows my progress in sanctification. You know, I can just, because I see in pictures, I see a lot of people sitting on their inner tubes, the tow ropes just going by, and they're just sitting there. They're going, man, I don't understand. I'm just like I was 30 years ago. I'm, I'm just as, as unsanctified as ever. What's the problem? The problem is not making those obedient choices. And, and the last line, justification is my... Position declared right in God's sight, but sanctification is my practice made right by becoming more conformed to his image. God wants me to begin progressing toward what I already am because of Christ's finished work. What I'm going to be forever, I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's my perfection in Christ. But boy, this earth is far from that. How do we get from here today to there? The Lord says you hook on the tow rope of my grace by your obedient, conscious, active, obedient choices to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And that's his plan. Well, basically, the doctrine of sanctification is all about our walk. Paul is speaking of salvation in two parts. Part one, we receive Christ. Part two, we walk in Christ. Receiving Christ is justification by faith. Walking in Christ is sanctification by faith. The words in Colossians 2, as you receive Christ, that's justification. So walk in him, that's sanctification. It's all connected. These two doctrines are joined like two sides of one coin. The justified ones go toward becoming the sanctified ones. As we were saved only by the accomplishment of Christ's death on the cross, so we live each day by the same faith by which we were saved. We're always dependent on Christ's gracious death on the cross that saves and keeps us. But the sanctification part, described by God from our perspective, is a chosen daily spiritual workout. Do you think the athletes we recently saw on television in the Olympics, do you think they just you know, got up from the couch where they've been eating potato chips and watching television 16 hours a day and just went to the competition and, and excelled? No way. They had a trainer and they had a schedule and they had a coach and they had a team and they had to report. In fact, when I was in East Lansing, we had a, a figure skater that, that was, I don't know if she ever made it to the Olympics, but she was in the Olympic qualifications. And I remember going to school with her. She always had a red nose and red face every day in school. And it's because she was at the skating rink at 4 a.m. And she skated three hours before school every day. Now that is the focused discipline for a temporal prize. And Paul says, why don't, why don't you decide you want the same for an eternal benefit, for pleasing Christ? So basically, and... And uh, it was 11 years ago that there was a speaker where I'm, tonight Bonnie and I are driving to Chicago and we're going to the Shepherds Conference, but there was a bald-headed speaker. Boy, I like those bald-headed ones. His name was C.J. Mahaney. 
And this is what he taught 11 years ago. I, I typed it out for you. Sanctification is a, is a process. It's the process of becoming more like Christ, of growing in holiness. This process begins the instant you're converted, and it will not end till you meet Jesus face to face. Though the work of his spirit, through the work of his spirit, through the power of his word, and the fellowship with other believers, God peels away our desires for sin. Notice who's doing it. Sanctification is me cooperating with God, peeling away the layers of my desires for sin. It doesn't stop there. God renews our minds, and God changes our lives. Sanctification is about our own choices and behavior. It involves work. Empowered by God's Spirit, we strive, we fight sin, we study the Scriptures and pray, even when we don't feel like it. We flee temptation. We press on. We run hard in the pursuit of holiness. Now, look down at your text, and I want to show you how Paul, he has two parts to his message, starting in in verse 7. He says, in 7, we're supposed to reject the wrong diet that will lead to spiritual ill health, that's anything profane and empty, and we're supposed to pursue, you know, this exercise program toward godliness. Now, look in verse 8, his first point. There are temporal benefits for physical exercise. And and what he says here is, for bodily exercise profits a little. And and what, what he's saying is, Paul is describing the discipline of integrity by comparing it to the effective but temporary bodily exercise. Paul agrees, we need to take care of our bodies. Exercise is part of that care. We're God's temple. And the best way to keep God's temple operating And useful and and usable by God is to keep our bodies in shape. We want our bodies fit as we present them as instruments God can use for his service. But the key Paul is bringing up is bodily exercise only benefits us during this life. It's temporal. Uh, I always remember, and I've told this story many times, but it's so vivid in my mind, Bonnie and I sat down to breakfast in Los Angeles in 1984 And across the table from us was the premier weightlifter of the day, Mr. Universe himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I bumped her and I said, honey, we're sitting with Arnie. Bonnie said, Arnie who? (laughs) He looks up, you know, at us. And uh, he was just finishing. And as he pushed his chair back and stood up, his legs were that big around. I mean, they look like a Greek statue. And I mean, do you think he still looks like that? The Los Angeles Times recently caught him out on the beach. (laughs) I mean, he, all of those muscles have gone south, you know? And he's just, he looks like, actually like a a hippopotamus with layer after layer of, of skin because he had bulked up this big and he's lost all that mass. And it was just layers of, of ridges. And I thought, If you don't keep it up, you lose the benefit. It's very temporary. So that's the first point Paul makes. But look at this. He goes on to say, but godliness, in verse 8, is profitable for everything. It has the promise of life that is now. I mean, it's the best life that you could live in the short time we're on earth. And it's the best of that which is to come. He says godliness benefits forever. He's saying there are eternal benefits for exercising spiritually. Now, he begins telling us, and and turn back with me to to, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, and and we will have to pick up with this later. I want to show you the three workouts, but here's just the first one, okay? 1 Corinthians 9. And what he's talking about is learning to run learning how to run the race. And and the Apostle Paul, in fact, if, if you take all of the the metaphors that he puts into this passage, he's saying that we need to learn to run, and that means looking ahead toward the Bema Seat of Christ. And what he does is he he makes the whole picture of the foot race, and, and he applies all of that to our spiritual lives with Christ as the judge, with our crown and reward in heaven as what's hanging at the finish line, and us 
as the athlete running the race. And basically, if you merged in all of the, the words that Paul gives in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, do you not know that those running in a race course, and he uses the actual word stadion for, for the racetrack, all run indeed, but only one gets the prize. Now he applies it to us. Run that you may win. Everyone who contends, and there he uses the word for agonizomai means to, to be in the, the agon. That was the name of the race. It was agonizing. It was an endurance race. And he says, everyone who contends or agonizes is self-disciplined in everything, that they might win the perishable Stephanos. That's the branch. They practiced for four years, the, Olymp the original Olympians, and they didn't get a gold, silver, or bronze medal that they could sell on eBay or sell for gold. They got a stick that was bent in a circle that had leaves on it that dried out and became brittle and went to powder very quickly. And he says they do it for this, this perishable victor's crown, but we for an imperishable. Therefore I run, Paul says. That's the word treko, trek, trekking. That's a Greek word. Trekking was opposed to peripateo, which is walking one foot another. A treko was, was fast, putting one foot in front of another. So he says, I'm running. I'm trekking. Not as uncertainly, but I box. Not as shadow boxing. I punch. That's the, the hoop apiazo word. My body and enslave it. That, that word, bring it into subjection, means to enslave. He says, I am learning how to connect so often to the tow rope of God's grace that my body is enslaved to go his way. I want it that way. I want to enslave my life to God's plan, not to the world, the flesh, the devil, and the temporal. And then he says, lest perhaps having proclaimed to others, look at verse 27, I should become... A failure. Uh, the New King James says uh, disqualified. That's exactly from the races. There was a judge who stood up overlooking, in fact, there were several of them. They w watched every inch of the track. And they watched to make sure you stayed in your lane, you didn't cut corners, you didn't uh, do anything that the rules said you could not do. And if you ever did it, at the end of the race, they would let you keep racing, but at the end of the race, no matter where you came in, they would call out, runner number three is disqualified. Now, a lot of people, Arminian types, think that means you lose your salvation. That's because they don't understand the games. Only citizens could compete in the games. Slaves could not compete in the Olympic games. Only citizens. If you were disqualified from the games, you didn't lose your citizenship. You only couldn't win the crown. It was all about rewards. And what Paul said is, I am learning to run, which means I'm looking ahead toward the bema seat of Christ. He is not only the referee, the judge. He's the one that hands out the rewards. And he says, I want as much of my life as possible to be staying in the lane following the course he planned for me, and finishing the race to hear his well done. That's the discipline of integrity that I don't just know this, but I'm personally pursuing personal godliness. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And as we do, this is Communion Sunday. Communion Sunday is when we reinforce this discipline of integrity. It means we choose to do what God's word says we're supposed to do. And as the elders and deacons prepare, let's prepare our hearts. And Father, I ask that at this communion time that we would hear your voice through Paul and down through the centuries. And we would today choose to begin doing like exercises each day, what your word says we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be not living by bread alone. That means we eat, but not just physical food. Just like we eat to sustain our bodies each day, physical food, we eat 
to sustain our spirits each day, spiritual food. And it means that, that we deny ungodliness in every form we find it in our life. And we ask you to turn on the lights and examine and search us and see if there's anything that's wicked that displeases you. And then we say, Lord, you bought me at a price. I want to glorify you with my body and my spirit because they belong to you. Dear Lord, at this communion, may we choose to do what your word says we're supposed to do. Help us to have that discipline of integrity. Thank you for the bread, the reminder that you came here and died just to save us so we could live the rest of our life for you. I pray we'd reaffirm that's what we want today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As the men come to pass the bread to us, we're going to sing that great hymn about God's grace that's greater than all of our sins. The second stanza talks about the, the turmoil we go to when we act like we're not saved and allow sin and despair to come across our lives. And as we read these words out loud, let them sink in that every time we feel the, the horror of sin, that God's grace is right there ready to, to speed us back on our way onto his pathway. So read together and then we'll sing the chorus. Here we go. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. And now together. Now the reason we hold this bread in our hands is Jesus said, this is a picture of my body. He says, I am the author and the finisher of your faith. He says, I've I am the one that came down to purchase for you. I invented the plan of salvation. I presented the plan of salvation. And if you personally receive of me my sacrifice in your place, you don't do anything but receive. I did it all. But if you do that, that's the beginning of me living my life through you. And I want to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you could ever dream of. It's just how much you're going to hold on to that rope of grace. And let me supply the power and, and the, the direction and the ability to accomplish all I created you to be. That's what grace is about. God says, I have wonderful plans for you. But you have to reach out by faith and deny. There are a lot of tow ropes in life. And most of them, all of them are going the wrong direction. Except for God's. And by faith, we reach out and we say, I want your way. I want the direction and what you created me and called and gifted me to do. And I am going to labor to focus my life like an athlete. And Jesus said, that's all possible because this is my body, which is given for you. Do this remembering me. And let's partake together. And what we remember, O oh Lord, is that we were bought at a price. And therefore, we are to glorify you with our body. We are supposed to yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness, our bodies as living sacrifices, our hearts for you to be at home in, and, and our very beings as your temple, that we walk around as as your representative to this world and we radiate your love and your peace and your grace but that's only possible when your spirit is ungrieved and unquenched and so we're so thankful for the cup this morning that reminds us that the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness there is no sin that is too deeply entrenched in our life. There is no stain that is too darkened upon our souls that your blood cannot cleanse away and make us white and new and a fresh new beginning. 
You are the God of new beginnings, and we're reminded of that every time we partake of this cup. Bless us, O Lord, as we sing about our motivation that we want to live for the glory of your name alone and in the power of your cross and the grace that supplies. To that end, we offer ourselves at this communion in the name of Jesus. Amen. As men come with a cup, we're going to sing about the name of Jesus. And, and this is a tremendous worship offering to the Lord. And let's make that to him this morning. The discipline of integrity is doing what we know we should do to please God with our lives. He bought them, purchased them with his own blood. And he said, this cup is the new covenant that's in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink, remembering me. Let's partake together. O oh Lord, you've told us that you died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him, you who loved us and purchased us to be vessels that are instruments in your hands to do your will in this world. At this communion, we renew our desire, our surrender, our cry to you. Take us, use us, meet us every day in the gym. Teach us to run this race. Teach us to wrestle against the powers of darkness. Teach us to box ourselves, our flesh, so that we will deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live pleasing to you. In your precious name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. And God bless you as you go.